Welcome back to the V Brown Bank stage. Welcome back to the V Brown Bank stage here at VMworld 2016 in Las Vegas. Joining me today are some of my colleagues with TVP Strategy. I have uh, to my far right the founder of TVP Strategy, Edward Haletke. Hello, thank you. And in the center, the amazing Steve Beaver. Greetings and salutations. Isn't it nice to be here? So, one of the things that we as, as analysts do is go and talk to vendors across the show floor and see what's going on, what's new, what's interesting, and really what our customers should be thinking about over the next few months. So guys, what was the things that stood out for you across the show floor? The edges of the show floor. The small companies around the, the edges where the innovation happens? Yeah, that's where the innovation happens. And actually, it's the first place I go. So I went left, I think Steve went right. And we just go to the edges and meet in the middle. But when you think about it, I was looking at, um, it's like row 700 or something had like Spirant, which was doing something really cool. We had Tufin, which was doing some really, really cool stuff. And as you move further in, it's like NVIDIA is like amazing. <laughs> I still like what they do. Um, but you got to look at everything. And there was a predominant security feel to the show floor this year. Uh, that's what I got out of but it. Was that ahead of the usual feeling that this is actually a storage show that has a few other technologies around the edges of it? Yeah, I think it was. I felt more, everybody mentioned security somewhere, somehow, I defeat ransomware, or I protect you against ransomware, or it was all part of their messaging. It was actually... The ransomware message seems to have come in really strongly, that it's it's no longer just somebody at home is being infected with ransomware, it's, it's real organizations are having their line of business applications impacted by ransomware, and it's hit the news enough now that we've got solutions coming back out. I've certainly seen that ransomware as a, a headline item for a number of different vendors in the last few Few months. Well, it's a headline item for some companies too. <laughs> yeah, not in a good way. <laughs> no, um, there's actually a new form of ransomware where they will actually lock up your machine and, and say, give me your bitcoins. So you go off and give them their bitcoins, they'll never unlock it because they can't. They don't even have the keys. As a matter of fact, inside the code, when someone dis disassembled the code, it doesn't even call home and send the keys to them. It just says, sorry, so it keeps on asking you for the coins. So you will never get your data back. There's just no honor among thieves. <laughs> Aren't we surprised at that, particularly here in Las Vegas? <laughs> yeah, not surprised at all. So being able to protect yourself against has been very important. And that's something that we've been doing on the Virtualization Security Podcast. I see it all around the, the data protection on the show floor. That's a big deal. Um, I also see a lot more about, I mean, like Tufin. Risk analysis, it does all the risk stuff. It predicts what you're going to do is risky or not. And if it won't let you do it, if it's risky, it's like, it'll protect you from yourself. This is good. Nice, nice, because we know that it's usually mis misconfiguration of a known fault that is most commonly exploited. Exactly. So, Steve, you turned left as you came into the show floor, or whichever way it was that, that, um, that Edward did not. What did you see as you were heading around? Well... Let me follow up on something that he said about security. It's interesting that it comes down to big companies getting hit or a lot of people getting hit. It's more like follows the same path disaster recovery took. Nobody took it serious until Katrina took out half the companies in the southeast. So it's, it's a shame that it takes something like this to happen to get it going, but it, it seems to follow a, a repeated path. Yeah, it's, it's the, there's a big difference between knowing intellectually that there is a problem that I should solve, but I've got other things that are more urgent, to actually knowing it viscerally, that I have felt pain, and, or I, somebody I know has felt pain, and therefore I need to act to resolve. Um, walking around, I did get to see a lot of instances where there's a lot less focus on virtual machines, and people are making um, changes in... They're rebranding themselves, changing their name. The focus for virtual machine is going. So I think we finally hit that commodity point where um, it, no longer virtual machine, now it's containers, now it's security, now it's the other aspects of the complete infrastructure. I would agree with that. There's a lot more enterprise ready or enterprise products out there now instead of just like the edge, I'm going to do something for virtual machines tied to VMware or whatever. And, when you think about that, that's a major, major change. But that actually goes along very well with what VMware's, VMware's 
where his future is too, where they're saying, okay, it's, you got vSphere for the traditional apps, I got Vic for people who want to go to containers, but you can go there with your traditional apps. And then you got the Photon platform for those people who want to go wholeheartedly in containers. And you got the Class Cloud platform to say, hey, I want to take those containers somewhere else. And it really ends up being all about the enterprise and those enterprise apps and testing of them, capacity of them, and moving them everywhere. So you're seeing that maturity model sort of progressing beyond dealing with the individual bits and bytes, the pieces that make up a VM, the actual VMs themselves, and more focus on what are the applications we're going to deliver, where are we going to deliver them to, what are we going to use as our broader platform for running those applications? True, yet the fundamental question of how do you define the app hasn't been defined by anybody yet. I mean, so it's, there's no product out there that says this is the definition of your app that you have in your infrastructure. Because what happens is the business goes, is my app down? They don't go and say there's a, these 5,000 VMs down. They just say the app is down. So I need to know what makes up that app all the way down to the storage levels. I need to know all the way down to the bits and bytes where they're stored, what makes up that app, including all the security, all the networking around that. And that's really an enterprise problem. Once I know that, then I could do some really fantastic stuff. I could automate, like, automate data protection in major ways. I can find out what I need to automate and do it, use it. I can now deploy applications anywhere because I know what they are. And did you like the, uh, what was it called, Network Insight? What was the Icon product that was acquired that gives us, extend some of that visibility of dependencies through the networking in ways that we've seen VMware talk about as much as five years ago with Infrastructure Navigator, possibly even really delivering those services, those, that visibility now? Well, I use virtual the vRealize Infrastructure Navigator almost every day. I love it. It's a great tool, but it's like the red-headed stepchild. I wish it wasn't. It has so much rich set of data and actually gives you that definition of the application with inside your vSphere environment and a little bit outside. Arkin first, first on the hop out, yeah. The first hop out, but Arkin on the other hand, or vRealize Network Insight, is a tool anybody can use and everybody should to get that, the handle on what's in the world's happening across this giant hybrid cloud that almost every enterprise has. And they may think, oh, no, I'm on site. Well, there's a little bit of finance or a little bit of this that actually uses the cloud, and that's part of your hybrid cloud. You know, I'm going to look at it as if this is back in the beginning of the day when uh, virtualization first came out. The sales guys would come up and say, look, we can do a V-motion. You are just getting started into... Um, Let's grab the low-hanging fruit. What can we virtualize? So now, what can we containerize? We've almost come full circle, switch directions, and going the other half of the way of infinity. I, containers and standards for that truly need to be standardized. I think there's a lot of experimental play and back to the wild, wild west of what can I do, what can I get away with, and what shouldn't I get away with? Um, and that'll be interesting. Well, well, living in the Southwest, I'd actually agree with you. It is the Wild West out there, especially in most clouds. And getting a handle on that is great. But I also agree that we are actually gone full circle. We're no longer worrying about the VM. We're worrying about things upscale of it. Yet we still can't forget the fundamentals. Now, where we are, the hardware. I mean, we, you think about the next chipsets that are coming out. There's going to, like Skylake, when it comes out in servers, sometime next year, I believe, or whatever, that's going to make people buy servers again and new processors because that's what they want. They want those chipset features brought up through the stack all the way up to their applications so they can make use of it. Security will be increased. I mean, it'll be the first time that that's happened in a long time. I think it'll be the first time that security will be baked in from the beginning, and that will be a welcome change. Oh, I would agree with you there. <laughs> Absolutely. One of the trouble spots that I'm seeing with the cross-platform cloud is certain providers are very keen on letting you in, but are not too keen on letting you getting out. And to be able to come and go from different clouds at will, I'm not sure how much of a sale that's going to be or how quick that will be accepted. Well, when you look at what some of the people are doing, there's actually some really cool technologies on the show floor, and one of them actually extends your, your storage into the cloud so you can try it out. You haven't cut the umbilical cord, it's actually a right-back cache. 
So it's actually right, you move it, it moves the bits you're using into the cloud, right backs cache to your data center, and you can find out if your app will work or if the security or the compliance is met. Before, it's like, kind of like, here, let me try the cloud. Oops, it may not work yet. Let me bring it back and then try it again after I make some changes or get some more feedback or a better way of designing my cloud. Try, catch, finally. <laughs> exactly. So one of the things that really interests me is that returning the circle to an immature stage with containerized applications that when we were very immature with the virtualization stack, security, manageability, visibility, all of these things were, were very difficult. I think we're seeing a return to that as if you look at the rate of change with products like Docker, we're seeing a return to those days where things are, are just moving so fast, it's hard to, to bring the other elements back in. Um, well, but they are. They're actually naturally there. If you look at um, the Photon platform, or Photon itself, the Photon controller, the construct of having a virtual machine or some sort of subcontainer that covers all your security bits is not unknown. We used to do that with operating systems. But now I can do a lot more in a virtual and cloud environment because I have control where I never had control before. I can micro-segment. I can put in fire, in inline firewalls. I can extend my networks everywhere. Containers benefit from that because the underlying container host is actually hyper secure. So they can do whatever they need to do inside that container host, but between containers is still the wild west. Once you're in the container going between them, that's a little harder to secure. So the whole concept that what Photon is based on and actually why I like it from a security perspective not necessarily from a container perspective, you got to, they're two different things, is that the one or three containers you need to make your app that service work are all with inside of one container host. And you have another one for the other ones and so forth, and they're faster to deploy, and I get all that benefits that VM, virtual machines have given me already. I got multi-tenancy, I get security, I get micro-segmentation of various forms, there's many different forms of that and I get better network security and so forth. I get all that for free, and whether I'm in a cloud or not. The only time I don't get that is when I'm bare metal. And speaking of Photon, there's going to be different additions and stuff that's coming to it. And heard a little rumor that more announcements will be coming out in Barcelona. So I guess we'll see what gets added to the Photon stack from there. I think that's one of the things out of VMworld that is pro this VMworld 2016 that is actually probably the one of the more interesting and relatively innovative concepts. And I think that what we're going to find out at Barcelona is more of the same and more advances along that path. Yeah, and Barcelona typically is the place where VMware announced management product updates and changes along with end user compute. So we saw nothing of that here. I think the, I agree with you that the um, container parts have been the, the most interesting things in the last two VM worlds has been all around Photon and, and Vic because remember that both were talked about at VM World last year and are still not ready for us to deploy. No, they're not, but that's actually pretty typical. NSX was talked about for years and it's just getting ready to be deployed. I mean, there's plenty of customers using it now, but there's still a lot, there's thousands that want to. Yeah, and it's still a science project deploy, and there's still some fairly significant issues about those of us who'd like to upskill in NSX getting hold of the actual bits to be able to play with it, which is a little played out in the uh, the Twitter sphere about that one. Yeah, it has, but I think that's changed. I think they've turned a corner. They've really listened, but I think VMware has to listen to the, t the community a lot more. I really well, do. And they came up for a tier structure for NSX, so there's going to be some kind of flavor, but to get the acceptance they want and the broad scope, it, there has to be a base that comes with to get everybody's feet wet and figure out which version will work for them. I think that's coming. I really do. I can't see them leaving that done, but like, look at, how, look at um, Storage vMotion. It only came in the higher end. Um, it, originally, it was an Enterprise, an Enterprise Plus. And, and, then and it, originally only in command line. Exactly. And in, thank, thanks to Andrew Kutz which, for fixing that for us. <laughs> but when you think about it, now it's in advanced standard and everything like that. So 
once it hits the head headway, I think it's actually going to drop, drop, drop. That's just a typical VMware approach, and that's fine. But we want it now. That's the problem. All those people that have been waiting for it want it now, and we've been had a, a big, long run into it. And we're still talking about today. But it still hasn't... It's not like vMotion, though. It's not it's something you're going to remember your first NSX. You're going to remember your first vMotion, storage vMotion. We need that moment still. And we've graduated, too, following the same pattern with cross vCenter vMotion. Either API or command line was the only way to get it started, and they're baking it in. So it's a repeatable pattern, which is kind of good to see some consistency that way um, to really be able to get into the meat and see some things. I would agree with that. But I also want to get back to the show floor one second. I still say, and maybe they got the best of VMworld, I don't know, I can't remember, but the, the coolest thing on there is not storage. There's a lot of storage on the show floor, and it's, if you have storage problems, there is a solution for you down there. <laughs> you can find one. But when you think about G the effect of GPUs on VDI and even on workloads, what NVIDIA is doing with the M60s, the M10s, the new, the new software and so forth, now that's amazing. That, that stuff is changing how we do VDI today. More than just VDI, it's getting into a lot of practical applications for medical use and other areas. And it's taken them a while to get to this point, and I don't think they've quite maxed out yet. So it's going to be interesting to see how things progress, say, in another three to five years. Well, until we can vMotion and vGPU-enabled VM, or change the resolution or the graphics adapter, quote-unquote, on the fly, or allow me to use CUDA even with the smallest subset so I can do security in my VM, even if it's a server, using CUDA or using the GPU to speed it up, especially for behavioral and analytics, this would be great. But there's a lot of, they have a lot of headroom, they have a lot of work still to do. It's a very hard work to do. I mean, you're talking about 4,000 cores and trying to evacuate all of them on a context switch. <laughs> it's not easy. So this is, they have a long, long, long way, but they're still getting to the point where most VDI deployments, most HCI boxes that do VDI don't even deploy yet with GPUs baked in by default. Mm -hmm. You have to add them. And that could be an expense issue, but the thing is if you're looking at buying an HCI box for VDI, it better be GPU enabled from the get-go or soon be able to upgrade to it because it makes such a big difference for Windows 10. When you think about Windows 10, you think about all those apps, Office apps, all those Windows apps that we're doing, they're all massively GPU enabled. They're using OpenGL, they're using other things. You just don't want to use the CPU for that. Now we're getting more into Office 365 for Replace. Are we going to be streaming apps in different ways um, to counter that? You will be streaming apps in different ways. I, I can see that as well, and the GPUs will affect streaming apps because it's still graphics at the end. I'm going to want them in the, I want to want them in the app machines, the ones that stream the apps. I'm going to want them in the receivers, and they already are in the receivers. So dragging it away from the show floor, we, we really should think about where VMware is going. And although we've discussed a Photon a little bit and, and containers, where else do you see VMware making their moves, making their changes in their business over the next couple of years? Partnership with the um, cross-cloud, the hybrid cloud, I think that's got to be one of their biggest missions. They're tied in pretty well with IBM. Um, they're customizing things to make it work better. Um, over 2,000 different partners on VAIR. Um, they still need to get some of the uh, bigger boys in there and complete the picture. And I think that's going to be one of their focuses from a business perspective. I would agree with that. I also think that they need to focus more of their products on... Actually, it's more about packaging more than anything. They've got to change to make sure their packaging is working for people. It, because it's actually, when you think about vSphere, it's actually very expensive. You think about NSX, it's very expensive. You think about vSAN, it's very expensive. But you also see the direction they're going into to a more vSAN, NSX, vSphere environment. And I think that messaging is going to go through almost all their products. I don't see that changing. And when you look at the show floor, you mentioned there's a storage for everybody. 
Um, I have to believe that hyperconverged and is really going to take a chunk out of traditional SAN going forward and vSAN or some type of pure storage or that along the lines is going to be a approach that's going to be more utilized going forward. I'll let you comment on that one, Alistair. Well, many people realize that I'm a, a big fan of hyperconverged. I, I like it as a, an architecture. It has some really good technical merit, and particularly the scaling, the predictable performance, the ability to purchase just the capacity that you need for the workload that you have, not the workload you think you might have in three to five years' time. These are all very beneficial. The challenge is that a lot of the hyperconverged platforms expect you to buy in small pieces, yet your budget comes in large chunks. And so there's a bit of a disconnect between the way we conceptually would buy hyperconverged and the way we actually have to buy hyperconverged because the budget to replace the servers falls this year, so you've got to buy a chunk of hyperconverged this year. So I think there's some real challenges around that. And then at the larger scale, the cost benefit for going hyperconverged versus a dedicated storage array doesn't necessarily play out so well as you're spending more and more of the compute resources of the host actually housekeeping your storage, the benefit of hyperconverged seems to start to get diluted and you may be in a better position to dedicate resources to being storage. So it's, I don't see that there is ever going to be one solution for every problem. Uh, there needs to be an understanding of what scales which of the technologies are suitable for and how to get the benefits that we dream of that the salespeople promise us when we actually go to use this in our real businesses. And getting back to what um, VMware's future, I see them decoupling a lot of their software. I mean, when we still look at it, Evo was all about hardware, hardware with software, and you couldn't get it without the hardware. I see the new, new, new way of going SCDC is a decoupling of that, where you can get the hardware from anywhere, or you could already have it, and you'll be able to buy the pieces. So they're going back to the roots of we're a software company, not a hardware company. We'll let Dell and HP and, and IBM and, and Cisco deal with that. But we'll provide you the SDC manager, the connections brokers, the, the connection servers and everything like that to make it all work around a hybrid cloud. But the fact that VMware is gonna be owned by Dell when the deal goes through, that's going to give them the hardware platform to go. So from a Dell point of view, this is a extra bonus with them for hardware configuration and SKUs they can sell. It is, but I don't think VMware is going to say just Dell, and I don't think Dell can say that either. There's too much of an ecosystem that wants other hardware, and that's just going to go on, and that's why VMware has to be as hardware agnostic as possible. And I see, I see a lot of that, because they're already the SDDC manager and the whole the, the whole a shared cloud, that software you can get with hardware, you can get it in software form, and you can get it on ready notes. You can get it for any one of those. So it's sellable in any way, form. And I think that's going to go forward because VMware has to sell to as many forms as possible. Every company does, because not everybody's brown greenfield. Not everybody's going to go buy a, a large chunk of HCI today when they have a working network and working environment already. They're going to go say, I want the SDDC manager so I can extend out. I want ES NSX so I can extend out. I want automation so I can extend out what I already have. And they need to sell that software and decouple as much as they can from the hardware. Yeah, Dell benefits, but so do the other vendors. Okay, one final question is we've got just a few minutes left, a couple of minutes left. What do you hope to hear from VMware at VMworld in Barcelona? Steve, go first. <laughs> All right, throw me under the bus. Um, I, I threw you both under the bus on that one. Yeah, you did. I'm, for me personally, I am uh, lifecycle management automation. That's pretty much what I spend most of my time. So having greater functionality with the automation for both inside virtual or cloud as well as other physical platforms, that is something I'd really like to see. So an extension of the orchestrator to have more capabilities. I guess I would like to see a version of Arkin that everybody can use today. That would be like really sweet. They also have, they I mean, supposedly have one, but I haven't been able to find it, but it would be really nice to be able to do that um, because everybody needs to get a handle on their network. 
But I also think that there's the whole story around photons just going to be much, much more mature. And we saw a, a, a glimmer of it last year. We see a lot more of it this year. I think Barcelona is going to really make that polished. I think that's their st that, that's the go forward story. And I expect to see a lot more of that. What I would like to see is something I haven't seen before. Something yeah. new, new something, I, in, something like truly, truly innovative. <laughs> that that wow moment that we've had at VMworlds going back a few years hasn't quite been there in in the announcements from VMworld, and and maybe they'll get their mojo back in Barcelona. That's what I like to see. That mojo back. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much, uh, Edward and Steve, for joining me here on the V Brown Bag stage at VMworld in USA. This has been the TVP Strategy Panel. <laughs>